it's a sense of membership, a sense of ownership, and a sense of, you know, that you're kind of at equal levels. It's not just about the expert PhD scientists talking to the public. It's which which is wonderful when you get that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, in its own way. But it's about communities now working next to the science holders, the knowledge holders working through ideas together. And this is something that museums and science centres have been working very hard on to get the public to understand how science really works and not have it to be some form of ivory tower. Today we're going to learn about just how museums can learn from each other through the Association of Science Technology Centres. You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. For hundreds of ideas, free experiments and more, go to physicseducation.com.au. And now, here's your host, Ben Newsom. Yes, welcome again to another Physics Ed podcast. Hey, this week we've got a great interview with Anne Hernandez. She is the Program Manager for Professional Development at the Association of Science Technology Centres, which is out of Washington, D.C., but looks after over 600, yes, I heard that right, 600 different science technology centres around the globe. And you better believe she's having lots of fun because she gets to visit many of these museums herself to help them out with their exhibitions and their programs and workshops they deliver to the public, which has got to be unreal fun. And yes, I'd have to admit I was a little bit jealous about some of the things she gets to do too, but hey, what else are you going to do as a science communicator but want to go to science centres? So uh, let's find out what she gets to do. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. Anne Hernandez, welcome to the Physics Ed Podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. I'm glad uh, to be here. Ah, I'm really, really happy to have you here and uh, so bright and early for you. What time is it over where you are? Um, It's just a little after three o'clock in the afternoon. No worries. Now, uh, if the listeners in the, um, I'm, I'm talking at 5 a.m. because I'm partly a masochist, but also uh, <laughs> Anne and I have known, us, known each other for a number of years. We've got a meeting coming up for for one of the PLNs that we have with ISTE, um, the International Society for Technology and Education, and that's coming up in just well, about a half an hour or so. So um, we thought we'd squeeze this in before I ran off to somewhere else. <laughs> okay, Anne, I probably should just ask, what do you do? Why are you on this podcast? Sure. Um, So I work for the Association of Science Technology Centers. We call ourselves Aztec. Um, My role here is on the professional development team. Um, I work mostly with um, inclusion efforts, but I also, because my background is in education, I work um, a lot of things that have to do with education um, and projects in in that field. So our organization is based in Washington, D.C., but we are a global organization. So we have about 600 um, members that are across the world. And these members are science museums, science centers, or like institutions. Um, Some are even individual um, independent consultants that help out out out-of-classroom or informal um, science organizations. So just listening to that and knowing what you've done, I, I think that you probably had the most perfect job if someone wants to geek out on seeing all the museums around the world. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty nice. You can go to any city basically around the world and one of our members, at least one of our members is there. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, like, seriously, like you have over 600 members. I mean, you've been going, going on for quite a while. I mean, what sparked this network Yeah, so it's an organization that's been around for decades, um, and it was really, it's about support. So all these science centers were kind of doing their own thing. Um, Museums were trying to find their path and educate their staff and um, try to find the best ways to talk to their communities. Um, And some people said, well, let's put this together and let's support each other, and let's make this an association. Um, And it just grew over time to this massive global um, organization that we have now. And we continue to grow, um, especially globally. We continue to think about what are the organizations um, that we can add to our membership and and help support um, as things change across the globe and as new science centers and museums are formed um, in, all, in all sorts of different areas. Now, um, you work in professional development, so obviously going around the museums, you've got to share expertise and share what other people know and do and all that type of thing. You used to work in the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum, right? Yes. How did yeah, you find that? that? 
Um, so the museum I found because I actually started as, as an educator in a formal classroom. So I taught second grade very briefly <laughs> for about mm-hmm. a year, you know, went through my schooling and that, but I also studied in the arts. So I studied music and I studied theater. And when I was in Michigan, I really decided to let my curiosity roam with um, going into the informal or out of classroom world, education world, and started just kind of doing any education job they had at the museum. (laughs) Um, Moved up into starting doing uh, video conferencing. So I was able to use my arts background with doing some really creative things um, on camera to teach classrooms across the world. Um, And just kept getting excited about all of these different levels in the museum world and this informal or out of classroom world. Um, and then eventually came this direction to DC to work for the association. So I could have that kind of big view of what's happening in the informal or out of classroom um, science education field. Got it. So, I mean, obviously um, you get to visit, you know, individual museums to consult and work with them directly. Um, but also you've got a, like major conferences that you're doing. Actually, you just described just before we went on this, uh, you've got a major conference not far away from now. Yes. Yeah. In a month, <laughs> we will be in my, my uh, whole office will be in California and San Jose and we're hosting our annual conference. Um, it's around 2000 people again, from across the world, from our membership that come, partners who come, so maybe like um, federal agencies, there may be corporations, but it's a full conference with lots of different sessions on different topics related to our field and in education in general. We have an exhibit hall, we have poster sessions, we have all sorts of activities happening day and night. And a vein of my work is also uh, in, in inclusion, equity and diversity work. So I'm going to be running several sessions and, and events around that work at conference. And I also have a fellowship that I run that is about diversity as well and leadership development. Okay. So you're saying you've got lots of time. <laughs> I have nothing to do really. <laughs> right. What do you, that's um, really interesting. So I'm actually just curious. I mean, obviously um, there'll be a lot of people listening in who are directly working in science museums and centers. I know we have a lot of teachers, high teachers, everyone out there. I know you're out there as well. Um, mm-hmm. The Obviously it's, you know, you'd, people would expect that there would be about here's an experiment, here's how we teach it, here's best practice, blah, blah, blah. It's just interesting you're talking about the equity side of things. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, a big um, a big movement right now is to understand the cultures in your community, understand the culture in your organization or in your school. So a lot of the work that I do works internally at organizations to build cultural competency among staff or the you know the main players, uh, volunteers, board members um, that are supporting that organization. And then it's also about community engagement and providing access. Um, And access can look in a lot of different ways. Often we think about, oh, let's have free memberships or free trips or whatever to our organizations, to museums. But it goes way beyond financial access and inclusion efforts. Um, So it's educating the people in the organizations about that. And it's also teaching them some some skills and tools, giving them some tools of how to go into the community um, and just listen, see, you know, talk to the people, see what their interests are, see what they, how they connect to science. What is their ways of knowing science? Um, you can think about it from anything from, you know, communities that are right outside your museum or your school or the membership that's already coming to a little further outreach. And, you know, organizations like physics uh, that are reaching and, and going into communities all across the world, you guys have to think about cultures across the world and how you're going to connect to their ideas. Absolutely. And actually, yeah, when connecting with people across the globe, um, just because they speak English doesn't mean they speak your English. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it makes it very interesting with certain nouns. Go get this particular material, and people have got no idea what you're talking about, and vice yep. versa. It makes that <laughs> makes very interesting discussions too. I always feel like it'd be remiss of me, and I feel like I'm really throwing you on the spot. But 
you've got this unique position to be able to go to all these different science technology centers everywhere. I mean, must say, uh, once you leave, I want your job. That'd be really cool. Um, <laughs> but the um, going all these different places, there'd have to be some real standout exhibits or activities that you have seen, and not necessarily the ones that cost a million dollars to put together. Because let's be honest, you see the, the high end and you see the low end as well. Yeah. Just what are the, some, just even just, yeah, I'm even just talking right now to give you like a bit of headspace to think about <laughs> what, they, what they might be. But what, is, what are some of the things that are going, wow, that is just unique, cool, and the public are clearly engaging with it? Yeah. You know, and I think, I think that last part there, the public engaging in it, and that's, that, those are the kinds of exhibits that really stand out to me is when you can see uh, different generations working together on an exhibit, interacting with an exhibit. Um, When you can see different groups of of visitors, like maybe it's groups of people that did not come together, but are collecting around an exhibit and interacting with it. I think interaction is a big one. So we're not just talking about looking at things in glass cases. Uh, We're talking about things you can pull and push on. We're talking about things you can write and respond to or, you know, video back a conversation um, and your reaction to that. Uh, There's a great exhibit called the Race Exhibit that gets into that equity and diversity conversation and understanding the scientific look at race, where it's 99.99% that we are the same um, scientifically and busting some myths on that. Um, they're also, and, you know, and that's a traveling exhibit that has gone to many different uh, museums and started many different conversations in, in these different cities that it's visited in the community. And I think there's something beautiful about that. But there's also uh, some museums that have really embraced prototyping and just putting out whatever rough idea they have and letting people, their visitors react to it. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. In fact, I only just, I mean, you know, approaching late September, um, we only just put out, I think it was episode 20 or 19 or something, like someone that one, one of those. But we spoke with Deb and Jamie Cook, uh, who run three organizations. One's Dissection Connection, one is Rock Hounds, which are outreach or sending out materials to schools to use. But they are very much doing prototyping of a bone museum in regional Queensland in Gympie, the Gympie Bone Museum. And so they just did, they only just did their very first uh, exhibit. In fact, they don't even have the walls yet. They're actually just borrowing space. Mm-hmm. And the Bone Museum was, we, we refused to have uh, glass cabinets. All they do is collect dust. They're really good for the cleaners. That's about it. Um, but the, they were putting together, having kids, like they were building you know, full-size camels and whatever else out of bones and bits. And people really, I think there's something to be said about it being gritty where People can watch it get built, which means they can actually feel an ownership to that site Mm -hmm. because they got to see it happen in the first place. That's a good thing. Yep, exactly. And that's another way to get your community involved, right? And and you're right. It's a sense of membership, a sense of ownership, um, and a sense of, you know, that you're kind of at equal levels. It's not just about the expert PhD scientists talking to the public it's which which is wonderful when you get that yeah. <laughs> um and you know in its own way but it's about communities now working next to the science holders the knowledge holders um working through ideas together when you have those very simple prototype down and dirty kind of ideas out on the floor well, one of the things that certainly comes up in science communication for sure is is the question that comes up is, is what we do talking to the converted? You know, is it just an echo chamber where the same people turn up to see the same exhibits and then they go to the next museum, they see the next exhibit, then they go to the next lecture series or they do whatever it is. Um, and I su- suspect that um, there's a real change where people are trying to work out how do we reach groups who don't particularly care about STEM or STEAM or whatever the acronym is these days. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's certainly tough. I mean, what have you seen with the organisations that you work with trying to break down those barriers to groups who are somewhat marginalised, someone that's not engaged with STEM? Yeah. Yeah, so the um, the term that you see pop up on grants and other things in the field right now is broadening participation. So it's getting beyond the middle class or or um, higher class 
um, individuals, often white, this is for the U.S. at least, often uh, identify with the race of white that are participating in museums historically, right? We're trying to break down some of those barriers to, to broaden into our community. And I think it's actually not necessarily that people don't care about science. It's that people don't realize that they're already connected to science, that they may be doing science or seeing science in areas that are affecting their life. And so it's finding different ways to, en- to get them to enter the conversation. And so there are a lot, of, there's a big movement I know in citizen science, which a lot of museums participate in that as well, or science centers pers- participate in. Um, citizen science means normal people contributing to scientific conversations or to contributing to data collection to help this bigger picture. And oh, absolutely. I mean, even just right now, um, just stop what you're doing, listeners, if you can, pause the recording, do whatever you have to do. Type in citizen science into your favorite Google type thing, and um, you'll find there'll be an association nearby. And if it's not nearby in your country, you no doubt be able to connect with ones globally because there are so many apps that are free that will help you contribute to real science. And that's a serious thing. I love that thing. Yes. Yeah. And now come so back. That- <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we hope you enjoyed looking up citizen science. <laughs> yeah, we make this interactive, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, now let's talk about what you found. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Actually, um, just what, while you collect your thoughts, because I can't interrupt you, but um, we actually spoke with um, one of the one of the main managers in Australia, um, Jackie Randalls the, in, from Inspiring Australia. Their job, their remit, is to, funnily enough, inspire Australia in different ways. And one of the things they do that is very much through citizen science associations. And it's a big deal down here as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a, a, a grant project that I'm on um, that I've been working with for just three years. We're going into our very last year of the grants, um, and it's out of the National Science Foundation. It's about the subject is citizen science. The research is actually studying partnerships between science centers or museums or even zoos partnered with a, another community-based organization. And it's how do those partnerships work to broaden participation while the community or these people are participating in citizen science projects. So what this project is, is supposing, you know, is, is hypothesizing, is that the best way to reach people in your community is to actually see where they're going, see what other organizations are attracting them, um, do have the means to, to reach out and, and seem more accessible to, the, um, to those community members, and then try to partner, partner with each other, talk to each other, learn from each other, especially if we're talking about big organizations versus small organizations, then we often kind of get uh, caught up on some bureaucracy things or, or processes that are not the same, but it's, it's trying to not only learn about your community, but learn about the other organizations in your community and be flexible. Try to um, understand how to work with them so that together you can reach more people and you can find where the assets are between your two organizations. With this is what I love about what Aztec does. It's not just a, um, hey, this is the cool thing I do. What's the cool thing that you do? And that's about it. It's well more, it's well far more meaningful than that. And does, I love the fact that you've got the Center for Advancement of Informal Science Education at your side. I mean, that's all based in research, right? Yes. Yeah. So we have kind of in our office, in our realm, we have research going on. We do a lot of work with understanding connections, which is really what I love about my job is understanding how these different communities, how these different organizations can come together. And we try to foster that sense of community between our members and our members and other organizations that we think would help support them. Now you've got some um, fun um, special projects that you also run on the side, like actually your organization as a whole, because it's not just you, there's quite a few people there. And uh, I can see there's, you've got Thunderbus Mini Grant Program, you've got Fab Slam, you've got a few things going on there. 
Yeah, we have a lot. We have a lot of programs here. Um, we have a, a project that's been running for many years now that is just in that research realm. Uh, the Center for Informal Science, Advancement in Informal Science Education. That's a great resource for for those people who are looking for more of that research side and evidence. But yeah, we we have many grant programs. Um, many of our members add us to grants that they're applying for and we help with that community um, and that connection um, or professional development um, realm of their projects. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot. I mean, I alone, I'm just one person and I, you know, have seven projects at a time, <laughs> multiply <laughs> that by 25 people and you got a lot of projects. <laughs> Don't we all? I mean, everyone from teachers to people running in the back, back house of a lab, we've always got more than one thing to do. That's for sure. <laughs> Without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm mm-hmm. going to throw you on the spot because look, you have worked at the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum. You've worked in science for quite a few years. If you had kids outside your door, something had gone wrong, weirdly they've turned up at Aztec instead of, <laughs> instead of a, a Smithsonian or something in, in DC, and they're like going, look, can you run a lesson for us? Have you got anything hanging around? If you had to suddenly just drop everything and go out there and settle them down and get a desk and run something, what would be a quick go-to experiment that you, that you know would just hold their attention? Uh, it's funny because immediately I thought, oh, when I have a couple coworkers who have young kids and they sometimes come around the office and I literally grab whatever's on my shelf, whatever, whatever kind of random toy <laughs> or whatever it is, <laughs> I immediately grab it and just make up a lesson on the spot. <laughs> um, but I would say the lesson, especially at Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum, the science experiment that I taught the most um, was talking about states of matter m- while making slime, two different kinds of slime. So I that would definitely be, if I had some ingredients, that would be my go-to. I could do that in my sleep, <laughs> talking about states of matter and making slime. Yeah, I imagine you've done uh, more than just several hundred demonstrations. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, we had a special, um, and they still run it, um, a special Halloween slime program. And I think, you know, it's like a hundred slime programs just in the month of October, (laughs) something like that. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Um, We um, were heavily involved with various museums around Australia through virtual excursions Australia. And um, we run special events, you know, often monthly. And one of the popular ones is slime day and slime day inevitably means that science centers just bring out their slime and off they go. But you can do all sorts of, sorts of weird stuff with slime. For example, the aquariums we're using, uh, talking about slime that's on fish and why is it there in the first place? Other people were using slime in um, like uh, modern history centers where they were uh, talking about the slime that were on convicts' toes due to lack of cleanliness on voyages to go overseas to prison <laughs> camps. It's kind of weird how you can just grab one topic and just run with it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's a nice way to finish up, isn't it? <laughs> just a, just a visual for everyone well, if you walk the dog or whatever you're doing. <laughs> it makes it reminds me, actually, we were talking about citizen science, and I'm looking around my office now thinking about, okay, what am I going to teach? <laughs> um, and I have a citizen science a little kit that um, came from the Oakland Museum of California. And they are so into citizen science projects there that they made, they're working on or making a vending machine of citizen science kits that you can take a little bag. That's with cool. you. And I have one right now that's about mites on your body, like in testing your mites and your armpits and things, and you can send it off. <laughs> and um yeah <laughs> that's There's fantastic a lot of it, things that, in science, but they're cool <laughs> that, that was a discovery that came out that people didn't realize that there were facial mites living amongst uh your eyelashes and things like that that come out at night and feed on your dead mm-hmm. skin and it's kind of mm-hmm. whoa was that right actually uh yeah. derek we, we interviewed uh derek recently um from the museum of human disease out of the Un- university of new south wales um and it uh, mind, mind you, mites are a natural thing. <clears throat> if in case everyone's listening, and wondering, is that real? Yeah, it's real, and it, it's quite normal actually, <laughs> part of your biota. But um, just just talking about the, the weird stuff that goes on on your body, you'd be very surprised. Yeah, and they were, you know, when we were talking about this kit with them, um, they were talking about how to trace back your mites to um, to your parents, and perhaps are the same mites. 
um, that your parents had and like, how does that work if you're adopted and like all these things. And it was just so, it was fascinating. And I was like, I want to learn more and more about mites. <laughs> we might, might do that. And yes, ah. I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh dear, that's awesome. Look, there'll be undoubtedly people who want to get in touch with you. So, uh, Anne, how how we do that? Sure. So the easiest way to get in touch with me probably is through email, and that's a Hernandez at ASTC dot O R G. So a Hernandez at Aztec dot org. Fantastic. And we'll put um, links up in the show notes. And especially, I think, for that, just, you know, you know, Oakland will be loving this, but I definitely think um, that just linked to that might project. Why not? <laughs> <That's a> cool, <laughs> we'll have to get some details off that and any other ones that you might have too. Well, now you've seen that your uh, your job is about equity. Now, how do you equitably produce something for 600 centres? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just the best way is go to ASTC.org and just check everything out. Probably the best way to go, I reckon. Um, but look, thank you very much, Anne. Uh, much appreciated for coming on. And funnily enough, we're going to sign off from this and I'll just catch you in the next uh, Zoom meeting room. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks so much, Ben, for having me on. No, I'm really, really stoked to have you and uh, much appreciate for your time. All right. Thanks, everyone. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're all about science, ed tech and more. To see 100 fun free experiments you can do with your class, go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F I Z I C S. And click 100 free experiments. Yes, and if anyone does get down to San Diego for that conference, drop me a line. I'd love to find out just what it's like to attend a conference organized by the Association of Science Technology Centers. It sounds like a blast, and I'm sure it's really good value for people who turn up. Hey, top learnings for this week. Certainly, if you're a museum or cultural site, how are you addressing diversity and equity of access? If you need a little bit of help in this area, I'd suggest reaching out to some professionals like Anne who will be able to point you in the right direction, which is really critical, especially when we've got such a diverse range of audiences who do attend these sites. Learning number two. Don't worry about being perfect. Now, I'm fairly sure I've said this on this podcast before, and I'll probably end up saying that again. It's okay to be a little bit messy, and it's okay to have people watch you do a work in progress. And you know what? It really helps you with the ownership of a site, especially if the audience not only watches you build something, can you get them involved as well? Tell you what, they will love you for it. You're just going to be able to find a spot where it's safe, and they get to do something that's of genuine value to them and to your site. And number three, reach out to community organizations wherever you can. It certainly will help you broaden participation without a doubt. And tell you what, maybe follow the advice of both Anne Hernandez and Jackie Randalls from a previous episode from Inspiring Australia where they talked about citizen science. It's certainly awesome. And tell you what, public love doing science. You just got to get the tools in their hands. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed podcast. Love your science? We do too. Here's this episode's education tip of the week. Grab your pencil and get ready to make some notes. This time I'm giving you a bit of a challenge, something that can't be done instantly but certainly will be worth your time if you put the tools in place. And what I mean by tools is genuinely real tools because what I'm talking about is actually setting up a maker site. Now, there's all sorts of listeners who are into this. We've got people from schools all the way through to museums. So a definition of a makerspace can be different for different people. But here's the deal. When it comes down to what is a makerspace about, it's simply the fact that we are all makers. We all like to create things. Things. We all like to build things. We all like to personalize things. All the maker movement is about is just providing an avenue and almost a permission to act on these fundamental drivers, the ways that we actually think as human beings ourselves. So how on earth could you set up a maker space without breaking people's arms and hurting them in some way, shape or form? Well, that just means you just have to do a bit of risk assessment. What are the things that you're prepared to have on your site that people can tinker with and play with? So do a bit of a risk analysis and have a chat with some different people about what are the things you can have to have. Now, makerspaces can be pretty industrious. They can have drills and lathes and 3D printers and all sorts of things. Or simply, they could just be craft glue and cardboard and bits of pipe and plastic and rubber. It's all up to the way you you feel is safe for your environment. So in no way am I saying this is the way to do it. I'm simply saying giving the tools and materials for kids to have a go at building something. Now, you notice it's a little bit open-ended. Makerspaces are, by their very nature, 
about exploring for yourself. Yeah, it might be handy to you know, show them how to use the tool safely and maybe how to wire up a circuit or something, but giving the people a chance to actually spend time with their own objects, their own things they want to create is critical for a maker movement because it's all about them personalizing their ideas. So there is a bit of a challenge. Actually, if you want to go into a bit further, type in maker movement or maker room or maker site or maker something into Google or some other version of where you can go find things on the internet and see the way other people are, you know, getting into this. It could involve all sorts of things. It can be DIY electronics or old phones they can pull apart. It could be 3D printing or playing with Arduino and Raspberry Pi and doing a bit of coding. It's all up to you. But hey, if you get into the maker movement, if you find a space somewhere in your site somewhere where people can tinker, everyone is going to benefit. I'd love to hear about people who might put things together, especially if you get the people who make the things to create a festival. So jump on our website, type in maker movement, and you'll find a, um, a blog about establishing a maker movement. There's a number of videos from Dale Doherty and a few others about the sort of things that you can create. I really, really think it's worth your time and you'll be joining a major global movement. Go be a maker. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're excited about science. Grab a copy of our new book, Be Amazing, How to Teach Science the Way Primary Kids Love, from our website. Just search Be Amazing Book. It's available in hard copy and ebook. Go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F I Z. ICS. In a recent episode, I got to speak with Karen Taylor Brown, who is from Refraction Media, which has been producing an awesome array of STEM publications, including the recent Careers with STEM and Careers with Code. Let's find out a bit more. So in Australia, 28% of STEM professionals are women. So there's a bit of a way to get to equity there. And a lot of the reasoning behind that is what I call you can't see what you can't be. There weren't a whole lot of role models within STEM professions that were going to be connecting with young girls. So we really wanted to create really dynamic visual publications that uncovered a real a diversity of talent doing amazing things. And we wanted to shoot them in locations that were really surprising and unexpected. So for example, I remember when we did Careers with Code 2014, we shot this amazing software developer who is also a trapeze artist on the weekend. So we did a photo shoot while she was doing her trapeze. Yes, head on over to the Physics Ed podcast on your favourite podcast catcher and have a listen to hear about trapeze artists doing STEM and all sorts of things with Karen Taylor-Brown from Refraction Media. And by the way, why not hit subscribe or even better, share it with a colleague or friend. I'm sure they might get a kick out of some of these stories we've been hearing about. It's certainly been a lot of fun to produce for you. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed podcast. Sign up now for our fortnightly email newsletter. It's loaded with details on new experiments you can do, STEM teaching articles, new gadgets, exclusive offers and upcoming events. Go to physicseducation.com.au. Scroll to the bottom and add your email. And that just about brings us to the end of yet another Physics Ed podcast. However, we still have more coming next week. We are speaking with Sibeli and Heike from Little Scientists. Who are Little Scientists? They are a group that's come out of Germany and they have certainly taken the preschools in Australia by storm. And so we can certainly hear a lot about how they did that. And until then, keep making your STEM classes as awesome and as fun and as informative as possible to grab your students' imagination. You've been listening to me, Ben Newsom from the Physics Education Podcast. And yes, I'm from Physics Education. I will catch you next week. All the best. You've been listening to another Physics Ed Podcast. We're excited about science. Subscribe to us on iTunes to download the next episode as soon as it's released. And don't forget, for hundreds of ideas, free experiments, our new Be Amazing book and more, go to physicseducation.com.au.